what we've done is we met with our industry insights team that has been covering all the breakout sessions and we met with them today at lunch and they had aggregated um, questions, challenges that you are articulating in different sessions and different the breakouts, et cetera. And we cherry pick those and we're going to talk about those. Hey, but before we get going, can I interrupt you for yeah, a second? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. I have something that I think will make everybody feel better. Uh, we have an, uh, we, we always do this. We have an off the agenda session. It's called the Senior Executive Roundtable and it's, it's uh, uh, typically, you know, I mean, it's some of the biggest and baddest hardware, software, industrial and, and healthcare device companies in the world. Um, and, you know, various chief customer officers and those kinds of things. And we, we have conversations about challenges and so forth. And anyways, we were talking about implementing AI and we had a discussion around the barriers that companies are facing in implementing AI. Any of you have any barriers? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so this kind of will crack you up. All right, so <coughs> here are, I think like, we asked like about seven barriers. Um, so again, 40 big global companies. How many of you, what percentage of them do you think say that they have data problems that are inhibiting their adoption of AI? 100%. <laughs> How many of them say they have problems with an end user employee adoption? 94%. <laughs> How many of them have trouble getting customers to adopt the AI interfaces that they have put out there? 77%. What percentage believe that the, their company has either a lack of vision, a lack of beliefs, or a clear AI roadmap, 72%. What percentage say our siloed organizational structure is preventing us from creating centralized progress on AI initiatives, 58%. Interestingly, lack of budget for AI, 33%. A perceived lack of corporate urgency, 36%, and a lack of experience on AI governance, risk, those things, 82%. So, you are in good company. Your frustrations, your issues are not unique to you. So, and I think. Um, but you know what the difference was in that session? Because six months earlier in Orlando, you know, at that conference we had all around, built around AI use cases, what we were seeing there, and we did that same session or, uh, you know, audience profile. And I think the biggest difference was there was more, much more of a sucking sound in Orlando, like crickets, like we kept asking, you know, we're seeing these use cases, where are you? And in six months, even though, th you know, all those challenges exist, the amount of energy and actual activity was way higher. Is yeah. what I, I mean, there was one company that said that their problem is they've found over 200 use cases. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Pro mini projects yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Ar around the company and yeah. they just can't control them. They don't know what to do with them. They don't know how to manage them. They don't know how to measure them. So, well, that's another good observation because the in Orlando, it was, well, we might have one or two pilots. We're, we maybe we're doing something. We're kind of thinking about doing something. Within six months, that's how fast this stuff is moving. Within six months, the problem now is governance. They were like, hey, it's not lack of budget. It's not lack of interest. It's people are on it, but now they're realizing I, we d what they don't have, the, uh, most of them articulated, there is no master sort of overarching strategy yet in governance and framing to guide all this energy. It's like, here's money go do stuff so it's it, you know the problem sets changed yeah right yeah it's super interesting all right so let's let's get to some of these challenges here um, and what do we have up here oh this is your favorite word that, that you know, I'm gonna put up here under advantaged <laughs> yeah so that I think that that is uh, still a lot that would you know there's a lot of uh, potential here um, for what we can be doing versus you know what we are doing yet and it's really I think the game is closing that gap as, as quickly as you can. 
So one of the challenges that our team heard here that was articulated is that you know a lot of companies are facing pressure to scale while keeping you know cost flat, and you know this is overwhelming. <laughs> and what are some of the good places to start? What are your thoughts on this? You know, I thought it was <coughs> it was super interesting in the in the opening day in the opening morning. Um, we had you know Mike who is the corporate vice president of customer success at Microsoft and then we had a boss who is the vice president of customer success at GitHub a subsidiary of Microsoft and uh, Mike said oh I think the best way to do this is just to go after the low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. and a boss said no 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 mm -hmm. what you got to do is go do this big hairy audacious initiative like we did, which reduced our support cases by 60%. Mm -hmm. So here you have two executives, really ultimately in the same company, yep. with two completely different philosophies. On how to take now, I, I th and, and But I think we would probably all agree, you have to figure out how to do both, mm -hmm. right? And that the, the low hanging fruit initiatives are gonna free up money begin funding the, the big, hairy, audacious, yeah, yeah. you know, AI initiative that you have. Um, and, and so, you know, I mean, j you know, you, you take something simple like, you know, the example that Mike was giving about case summaries, right? And, and you know, how you, if you think of how many minutes per case I can, you know, solve with a case summary, because it's all, you know, I, I've got all the, the audio. Um, and you know, I've, I've multiplied that times the number of cases and it turns out to be this many FTEs that I could do the same thing with, with this many fewer. Okay, great. So there's a chunk of money that can go over here to, to fund this thing. The, the, the interesting thing to me, and I, I, I've said this before on this stage, but you know, I, I, the, the percentage of total investment that we're making in the life cycle on technology is growing and growing and growing, right? I mean, let's, you know, there is, you know, there is probably gonna be, you know, if you look at the, the human capital part of your income, you know, your budgets and the technology part of your budgets, I mean, it's already, technology's been going and going and going and it's, it's just gonna keep doing that, right? I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to, to do here. Yep. And, and yet, and yet there are so many organizations, whether they're PS organizations or CS organizations, or that basically don't have anything that looks like an R&D budget. Mm -hmm. um, anything that really looks like a real budget for data analytics, a real budget for software development, a real budget for, and, um, and you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't tell the product organizations that they've got no budget for R&D, right? And, and so I think we, you know, you do have to do this game that we're all so good at, and we've all learned how to do for so long of, here's the low hanging fruit, and I'm gonna, you know, figure out how I can deploy an AI solution to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm gonna take the nickels and dimes that I get from that, and I'm gonna put it over here, and I'm gonna have my big audacious goal but I, I really do think there is a there is a there's a a conversation that needs to be had with the C-suite around the, the the kind of absurdity of you know you hit you give we have all these goals you want us for cost take down and mm -hmm. you know differentiation by services or you know whatever reduce time to value for customers you want us to go do all these things and we're trying to do it with technology but we really don't have I mean, we're robbing everything we do mm -hmm. to be able to put nickels and dimes together to go after these things. I mean, yeah. what, what if we thought about really formalizing a percentage of X mm -hmm. in the form of an, of an R&D budget, you know, so. Well, I, so would I play against that? Because I, so I, th you know, playing back, what you're saying is, look, probably our operating model is going to have to evolve here and the way our P&Ls look and how much we invest in technology. And I completely agree with that. And this question about this pressure right now, like what do I do right now? Because 
that conversation is going to take me a while. We've got to rethink it, and that might be, you know, months or quarters till we can come to an agreement on that. I would say that in the short, short term, the, the, the guidance that, that I would give, and we've got tons of content on this, this is why we've been chipping on this for a while, is what we know for a fact is, you're right, there's all these potential thoughts on how we could use AI, but there are already mature, proven use cases. I would A, start there. There's a paper we put out almost a year ago called the Wheel of Success, AI Wheel of Success. What are the attributes of successful AI projects? Go read that. And what I'd be doing is looking for projects that fit that profile, and I would start taking, and by the way, these aren't really like little pennies. If you can take, if you, you know, if you can reduce, you know, caseload by 30%, that's not a little penny. If you're Dell and you can reduce spare parts, you know, uh, not shipping by 14%, I mean, there's some money, money. I would get your sea legs there, be very focused on those initial use cases, get the proven ROI, and then you're going to be building battle scars and capabilities that start to set you up for the big home runs that you want to swing and start to set you up to say, hey, by the way, we got to change the operating model. And, and as you said, that stuff is known. I mean, we yeah, the, yeah. go to our portal and <laughs> yeah. have at it, and you'll find the, yeah. thing, the use cases that have actually happened. And yeah, and I, I don't want to lose this thread because from, from day – and I'm proud of this. From day one, when you know AI, you know, just went exploded with um, ChatGPT, and everyone started freaking out. And the first conference right after that, everyone's talking about it. My gut, and the gut, your gut, and the research team, we said, look, there is going to just be all kinds of hype and noise, and the first thing that members are going to need is a sense, a baseline of reality, and that's really what we've been very committed to do with these case studies, with th these heat maps, with the type of content we're creating, is we want to enable you to do this, to you know, cut through a lot of the noise and just start moving forward. So let's go to another one here. How can we bridge the gap between employees eager to apply AI and those that are hesitant or reluctant to do so? I'll, I'm going to give an ane anecdote on this one that we heard from um, uh, an executive in that session you were talking about. So, and this was a, um, a sales leader and we were asking for use cases and what people were doing and he started to describe this use case where for their their BDRs they had developed an AI capability to customize their um, outbound emails using AI to and what and when AI wrote them they found that the open rates were what three times as high you know the take rates so so the performance of this outbound communication just went like this when AI was applied. So they started it out as a pilot, and what what is happening, and we hear this with all pilots and you know AI capabilities, you have a certain set of early adopters who are like, oh God, this is cool, I wanna try this. And that's what happened. And then they got the results and they saw that it was real. And then they said, we're gonna roll this out across all accounts. And what happens, lo and behold, there are sales executives who say, no, 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 no. <laughs> We're not using this in my account. We're not, I don't want AI touching my account. That's got to come from me. And what, your automated outreach to my account? Oh, ho, 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 I don't think so. Does that sound familiar? Does that, does that ring a bell? So, so I, I asked him the question. I said, well, how, how did you solve for that? He goes, we, we gave it a little bit of time, and then we mandated it. And I think that for some of this adoption issue that we're facing right now, I would be seeking out the early adopters when you're piloting, when you're proving results, but there is an inflection point for every AI use case where it will be non-negotiable for the employee to use it. Non-negotiable. If you have marketing people, they're like, I don't really want to use AI, and, and they're taking, you know, 10 times as long to create the same amount of content, that's, that's not okay. It's not going to be okay. So I think there are going to be these inflection points. What, what well, I, you know, th there is yeah. there is an analog to this that everybody in this room has ha had this experience in your life. So you know, you, you've got a your company has a product and the product's been discontinued, but you're still supporting the product. And at some point, you say, I have to end of life support on this product. And you've got these customers out there that are loving, still loving the product, right? And you're like, oh my God, you know, so, so what do you do? Well, you start this process of basically 
turning up the heat on the water, you right? You start with incentive. Yeah, you, you start incentives, incentives like, you know, product. hey, the, the replacement product can do, has all these great features and capabilities, and you get a few of the old comp users to jump onto the new product. Then you start increasing the price of the support, uh, you know, on the discontinued product, and you try to get as many people to, to, to self, you know, exit, uh, and then eventually you, you, ha you do have to say, I'm sorry, but we're not fixing bugs on this product anymore. We're, yep. you know, we're yeah. not going to take calls on it anymore. It, and it's the same kind of thing, right? You've you got to get as many people to want to jump out <laughs> of the old yeah. ways yeah. into the new ways as you can. And so, you, you know, you, you, you got to, you know, I mean, like literally s things like UX, UI matter. Mm -hmm. You know, like I if if to get the employees to go do this, they have to exit this system and go to that system and blah, 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 blah. Forget it, right? So you got to have good UX, UI. You got, you have to, th it has to be clear value to them, mm -hmm. right? You, you can, as everybody said, you, more of the stuff you like to do, less of the stuff you don't like to do. Um, sometimes there are people who like to do tasks that they're just not going to have to do anymore. Yeah. And as I said on, on Tuesday, you know, it's our job. Yeah. I, if, if we're going to take this task out of the repertoire, then we have to figure out what the new task we want this group of people to go do. Yeah. And it, so it's up to us to figure out what it is and to create this learning path, right, I, I, that, that takes them from good at this to good at this. Not everybody will make it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, again, at some point, at some point, you do have to say, this is not optional this is a requirement and yep. that doesn't work for you you know i understand yeah. yep. but 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 there is a lot of active management you can do to to drive this down you just got to be like anything else super planful um you know i, I was laughing when when uh, Je jessica was talking about you know you go do an offsite and mm. everybody does myers briggs mm. you know there's going to be a little bit of that going on right because you know you, you again some some super technical people you know, you may be asking them to do uh, some new skill that that they're super uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so maybe they have to go to a different role, right? Because the new, the new task in the same role mm -hmm. is something that doesn't align to their, yep. you know, psyche. So, yep. uh, but it, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's got to happen. I'll just give one more example of sort of the, the forcing function because in that same session, so there was an example of the sales leader saying to the sales to the account execs, non-negotiable, we're gonna use AI. Then another executive who had CS said, you know, it's not just salespeople. So th he talked about this massive investment they'd made in AI on the portal so that people could more cut, you know, uh, self-serve. And there were their support tech, people were like, no, no, those are my cases. I wanna talk to, the, you know, that holding it close, like I want that interaction with the customer, that's important to me. And he, he got to the point, I think, where he said, look, I took the phone number it was not that you can't call us anymore. You got to start in the portal there. And he just, he had to force it because, you know, and I think this is a good question. I think you are going to see a lot of what you were just describing. People are either going to be uncomfortable with the way workflows are changing or they're just going to be like, but, but that's just like so important to me, to having that phone call, doing it this yep. way, right? And, you know, we all have to be thinking about the fact that, hey, y y y it was important to you, yep. but it's just so much better you know, and I, I'll tell you personally, you know, I, I'm a, a writer. I've been r writing for 25 years. And when these tools first started coming out, it, I, I was like, do I really want to do this? I mean, this feels weird. Now, it's like there's no better way to accelerate your writing. I it mean, so. There's going to be research done that, that, that makes the point that there are a lot of customers out there that actually would prefer <laughs> to work with it's an AI, a really good AI agent than yeah. a person. And that may hurt people's feelings. Yeah. But having that data, yep. right, to, to, to hand to your staff to say, hey, look, this is actually something that the customers, you know, prefer. Yeah. And n no, no personal jab. It's yeah. just so, so jump on the, you know, on yeah, the bandwagon. Yeah, and I, because I think there's a question here. I'll, 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 I'll just kind of move it up. There's a question about this issue of, gosh, if we go to AI, if we go to digital, how do we, we lose the relationship? We lose the personal touch, the customer. And in, in my counter to that, because we all can relate to these experiences personally, is, you know, the, 
the B to C world has definitely taught us a lot on this. So, you know, we all have a very digital relationship with a company like Amazon. And if you would ask me 10 years ago, Thomas, you're going to click and buy items that are several hundred dollars and not even think about it. A completely digital experience. I never talked to a rep. I never, I just went boom online. I've been like, you're crazy. I got to go touch it. I got to feel like I got to talk to somebody. We have gotten very conditioned that that's completely okay. I think about the airlines that, you know, 15 years ago, I wanted to call the premium line and stuff. I don't want to do that. I want to get on my phone, book it. And so why do we think if all of us have leaned into that and there are better experiences that that's not going to work in B2B? It is. I think, I think it is. This focus on new versus expanding, right? And I, I will tell you, I was kind of surprised when the, the team put this on the table because what I know from the last, well, since 2022, but for definitely the last year, is so many members are like, look, our growth has got to come from the install base because it is so hard to get new net new logos. I don't know how many people you know feel like that, but hey, my market's pretty mature. There's not a lot of greenfield out there. And so if we're going to grow X amount of percent this year, it has got to come from you know existing customers. So I kind of feel that there is already a lot of focus on there, but how do you, how do you think about this question here? Well, th there there is no doubt that you know it's the same reason. I think there's a question coming up later about you know about the uh, what's happening between s customer success and sales yeah, right. right now because right. because it is harder it is harder to go n new logo selling than than probably ever, and so everybody's trying to figure out how to get the maximum amount of revenue out of their their installed base. But um, y you know th this. This question of long-term client relationships and, you know, basically getting customers to buy everything, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, you know, at the, end, at the end of the day, sort of, that's our goal, right? We're not building new products because we, you know, don't want customers to buy them. We're building new products because we want to go back to the installed base and get them to buy everything, right? And, um, and it, is, it is absolutely the case that setting the conditions for success up front with a customer is the key to building a long-term client relationship. And, and so, you know, I, it, it, I was running a company in the 1990s when Siebel Systems happened. And I've told this story before. And if you remember at that time, Siebel Systems was the fastest company to a billion dollars in revenue in history. Mm -hmm. And Tom, um, had this super unique philosophy. You know, he came from Oracle and he was in sales and all that kind of stuff. He had this super unique philosophy where the way the salespeople, the salespeople were compensated based on the size of the order mm -hmm. and they were paid when the customer got to a certain level of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. yep. So they're holding back the commission of these salespeople until the customer, because we were doing their customer satisfaction yeah. work, mm -hmm. right? And so, my God, did that change the behavior of the salespeople. You know, if they knew that, you know, overselling, stuffing too much product into the initial deal, if that was going to cause dissatisfaction, they stopped doing it. If they knew there were certain services that were really required for this customer to be successful, they brought in the service specialist and they had the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. They started doing the right things to set the conditions for success yeah. with customers and it led to super successful large accounts. And, you know, and, and that was in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. You know, here we are, whatever, almost 30 years later and we're still getting this, mm -hmm. still getting this question. And, um, and uh, the, 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 the value, um, you know, th that's another thing that, and again, I've said this before, that I think is really convoluted thinking, which is in services um, that there is this hesitancy to, to drive the customer to, you know, ad adopt a new thing if the new thing costs money even if that new thing is going to drive the next leg of value to the customer. And, and we have people like, uh, I'm not a salesperson. I, I don't do that, right? 
when, when, when we start going through, which we are all going to go through, I don't care what part of the company you work in, this task migration. Here's a list of all the tasks my people could be performing from the lowest value to the customer to the highest value of the customer. And I'm going to start, like we just talked about, using AI and continuing like you've been doing, using automation in any form to take some of those low value tasks away. And as you do that, you're going to be asking the employees to do something higher up on that value chain. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through this period of migrating the task list from what it is today to, to something new. And, and at some point, you know, you've heard it on this stage already that I, I've got my agents talking about next best X, mm -hmm. next best feature, next best service, next best module, next best, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and those things, that next best thing adds value to the customer. And if your product marketing department has not been able to translate these features into value for the customers in some kind of quantifiable way, you should be bitching at them, right? Because you've got to be able to do that. But, but the reality is we have, on the services side, so sales has its own issue, got to learn to set the conditions for success, sell the customer the right product, not the biggest product. Um, and, it, and so they've got to, and again, tell the get the services in there that are required. Uh, we have our own issue on the services side too, which is we're afraid to have a conversation that smells anything like sales, um, when in fact it's really helping the customer. I mean, you know, how long ago was it that we wrote, helping will sell, selling won't mm -hmm. help, right? Yep. So, and just to amplify to those those points, right? So. If if you're asking this question, we have to do better with the install base. Setting the conditions for success becomes a mandatory, you know, capability. Like, yeah. hey, we got to make sure we're coming out of the gate correctly. If we want an install base that's happy and going to grow. N number two, this issue with services as a channel, right, for expansion, et cetera, which is a square we've been on, you know, for forever. I mean, we can tell you definitively, service organizations are an incredible source of leads. There are companies, th members we have that have instituted formalized lead generation programs for field services, for support, et cetera, and that pays off. It takes a little while to get it going, and part of it is to get the service people to go, whoa, 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 but once you start to basically condition them and say, that's part of your value add to the customer, <laughs> that if you hear the pain and the need, let's document that, capture that, let's get you know the sales conversation going. So I, I think if, you know, if you want to be better at expansion, it's just not going to naturally happen, yep. you know, and it, yeah. It, and one other thing uh, I said before about product marketing is absolutely true. You know, they should be providing a ladder document to you that basically says this set of features creates this kind of value for a customer. And literally, as you move the customer up as customer success, you know, and education and everybody else moves the customer up to these higher order, you know, next best thing in the product or to the next product. Everybody in services needs to understand in their heart what that customer value is. Mm -hmm. don't, don't guess at it, you know, whatever. It should be documented, it should be clear, they should be trained on it. They should understand why they're suggesting that it's the next best thing. Um, and if product marketing isn't delivering that to you, you should be raising hell. All right. We're going to get to your questions in a minute here. I think we got a couple more. The, um, how is the current economic environment changing the role of customer success and the role of sales? And we're not too siloed. And how do these two things work together? I mean, this is on the table in a big way. And um, I don't think it's going to come off the table. I don't think, you know, economically things are going to change and people are going to be like, hey, who cares? We just got plenty of money. Just like throw throw a headcount at it. The technology's making us rethink it. Um, so what are, what are your opening thoughts on this one? Well, you know, a boss said on Tuesday that, and you know, again, he's, he's, he spends a lot of time in the SaaS world, right? Mm -hmm. And in the SaaS world right now, you know, I like you were saying, in prior to, you know, whatever, eight, 19 months ago, when interest rates went up, 
it was just a world of grow, 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 grow. Yeah. And every private equity CEO and every SaaS CEO, that was all they cared about. Don't worry about making money, whatever. And so anything we did, any dollar we would spend, if it increased, you know, 50 basis points of renewal, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So customer satisfaction, customer success organizations grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And it, it didn't matter what, how much it cost because it, the cost weren't the issue, it was the revenue that was the issue. Now all of a sudden, like almost overnight, mm -hmm. as a boss said, a target on the back of the customer success organization. I would say two targets on the back. One is that the, the companies have all of a sudden got to stop burning cash. They've got to. And so look at all that money. I'm not gonna cut sales. I'm not gonna cut, well, maybe I will. I'm not gonna cut product. You know, marketing out, customer success, mm, target on their back, right? The second target is <coughs> the sales force wants the renewal. In many cases, the renewal moved over to customer success, which is, by the way, where we think it should live. Um, but it's, you know, harder spending is tougher in this, econo in this economy. Uh, as I said, new logos, harder to come by, all this kind of stuff. That renewal you know, I want some credit for that renewal. I don't want the credit to be over there. I want it to be in my sales comp plan. So we, we want the renewal back. Um, and the argument, I can do much better at upselling and cross-selling at renewal than the CS organization. And, you know, m maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. Uh, but it's also taking a sales cycle away from something you, else you could be doing that could actually provide more revenue and, and more profitability to the company, but they want to go where the revenue is easiest to get. So, so customer success has right now is in a super tough space because the CFO is after the cost of it and sales is often ap after the revenue of it. Sure. Um, in, in, you know, I, I, I think our data suggests that neither of those are smart moves. I mean, reducing those customer success resources is gonna impact renewal, it is. And the, the, for so many renewals, so many renewals, the logical place to renew it is in customer success. I mean, they're gonna renew. Mm -hmm. And you know, we should have enough data to say, is there a big expansion opportunity or not? If they're going to renew, renew and there's not a big expansion opportunity, why the hell would you hand that back to sales and pay a salesperson a commission and, and take the time out of their life to run a sales cycle when it was unnecessary? Yeah. So it, it, is, it is, you know, it is, we, we do strange things uh, depending on what the market, what our shareholders are yeah, I mean, wanting from, from us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... On this one, I, uh, so I'll, you know, my, my thoughts on the table here is I think everything you articulated in the pressure we feel right now is all that is spot on, right? And, and you're right, I think the dangerous move is if you just start saying, well, I can't afford that CS stuff now, boom, you just created a lot of bad downstream things in the business model, yep. right? So I, I don't think that's the winning move. I, th I think um, that these, what technology is actually starting to, to push on this question. Because if I had a sales executive who was focused on a certain set of activities and things, and I had a customer success person who was more obviously focused on the adoption, kit, but now I have technology which is, let's say, either enables a CSM to be smarter as a salesperson or a salesperson m smarter on helping, then you start to go, well, do I really need two distinct people? And that's not gonna happen tomorrow, but I think that's one of the things people are gonna start trying to yeah, I mean the, the, I mean think through. The, the, the one caveat I would make is there were stupid things done during the go-go. I mean, mm -hmm. there were some companies that wildly overspent on customer success. Oh yeah, for sure. Who, who for either religious purposes or whatever, never monetized it. Yep. I mean, you know, just dumb stuff. Yep. That needs to come out. That, I mean, you know, I mean, if you overspent, you got to right size. Yep. If you, if you didn't monetize, you got to monetize, right? I mean, there's just, 
that stuff's got to be done. Um, but, you know, but to your point, you know, and I don't know, I don't n know, this dance, this super silo dance that we've always had between sales yeah, and services. Yeah, that's what I'm chipping on. Right yeah, that, that yeah. I mean, that, that's, it's, again, just kind of like what I was talking about before about, you know, salespeople being incented to go jam as much license into the deal or product into the deal as they could instead of setting the conditions for success. Yeah. Um, you know, th it, it, th I believe, as we discussed, as we discussed a couple times, you know, pricing models are about to change. Mm -hmm. And that, if we move to consumption-based pricing, which again, if, if you sell units to users, and that's how you monetize, and your employees, your customers, are not growing their employee base, or maybe even getting more efficient, and those number of employees are going down, th um, there's gonna be a lot of conversations about alternative pricing structures. Yep. And if we move to consumption-based and we say there's high value cons units of consumption in my product, there's lower value units, I have a price for them based on their value, I count what they are, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the value of the contract up front is virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. It is a, the right to begin to serve. Yep. And as I serve, I monetize, right? Um, then you take this dysfunctional siloed behavior between sales and services. You better fix that super fast. You better fix that super fast. And so, um, so I, I think that, you know, that I it's, it's crazy to me that after all these years and all the conversations we've had in this community about, you know, getting sales and services to play nicer in the the sandbox that we're still having the conversations yeah, yeah. but I do think AI AI where everybody's doing this task migration mm -hmm. yep. taking services more up the you know whatever you want to call it the sales route like next best thing yep. and taking a lot of the low-level sales functions away from the sales tasks away from the salespeople yeah. and, and, and what are they gonna do nothing no yeah. Yeah. So I just think there's going to be th this, and again, uh, you know, move to consumption-based pricing models could r rapidly accelerate this conversation. Yep. But I can't, I can't see sales sitting over here and services sitting over here. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. And, and by the way, it's not just what's the relationship between you know, the CSM and the sales executive. Well, what's the relationship now between a CSM and a support technical person? What's the relationship between a senior technical support person and a professional service? I think all that's going to blur. I'll put a plug in. There's an article out on the portal called um, a success-centric organizational structure, which talks about what would a next-generation org structure look like. I highly r recommend that. That's cross-functional. I would definitely take a look at that. We really appreciate the time here, and I think Martin's going to come out and, and yep. close us. But uh, as always, fun talking to you. Thank you. you.